As of the time of this video, 42 seasons of the hit show Survivor have aired, with seasons 43 and 44 coming within the next year, so I figured why not make a yearly ranking of every winner with big spoilers across this whole video. This is your warning. Turn back now if you don't want to know. For this video, I had you all fill out a survey I posted on Patreon and on my community tab where you simply voted whether you liked a winner for who they are as a character, their gameplay, or if you just didn't like them at all. Then at the end of the survey, you could give a bonus point to your favorite winner or take one away from your least favorite. And believe it or not, this results in one winner having negative points and a few having more than the max of 100. Almost 700 people gave me their input and wow, thank you so much for that. Now with that explanation out of the way, I wanna give a big thanks to the patrons for supporting this channel and making it possible to do huge videos like this. If you would like to join them in supporting Once Upon an Island and picking what videos I make, along with watching all of them weeks and even months early, check out the links in the description below. So with that, it is time. Every winner of Survivor ranked, starting with the tier of winners I am calling a big bag of underwhelming. Number 42. Well, well, well. Chris Underwood of Season 38, Edge of Extinction, is the only winner to have the distinct honor of being voted out and coming back and winning. Seasons prior and even after have given players the opportunity to pull this off, and Chris is the only player to be successful at it. After being unceremoniously voted off third this season, he lives on the edge where him and Reem get into fights, him and Rick Devins bond, and when he returns at the final six, he is gifted an idol from production, which helps him go on a tear by tricking Lauren into playing her idol for him, playing the idol production gave him, and winning immunity. But then he makes the bold choice to drop his immunity necklace and go against Rick Devins in fire as a last ditch effort to secure his win and it works. I think the end of his story is so wild. That finale is like a movie all in itself. But many of those who voted on this list found major issues with how he won and hated the fact that the show allowed this to happen since the twist is utterly broken here and favors anyone who goes to the edge and then comes back and reaches final tribal council. So Chris Underwood scores a negative 7.1%. Number 41, Jenna Maraska of season six, the Amazon won four immunities and was the last remaining woman against a group of guys led by a quick-witted snake who is the favorite of almost everyone after the season ends. So why is Jenna so low on this list? Well, her story comes across as someone who stumbled into winning rather than playing a game that impresses. And at one point she even wants to quit because she's sick and seemed to lack any sense of how to really play the game well. She seemed to be dragged to the end as bigger threats were eliminated until she won the last two immunities so she could sit next to a goat in Matthew. It ain't much, but it wins her the $1 million. I do have a story video all about her if you are interested in her journey, but for now, Jenna Maraska scores a 7.4%. Number 40, Brian Heideck, oh boy, of season five, Thailand, he is something else. I can already sense people being upset he fell this low on the list. After all, he seemingly dominated the entire cast and conned them into giving the Iceman the win. However, he only got one more vote than Clay Jordan, possibly the biggest goat of all time to sit next to, and is clearly the scummiest winner of all time, and he embraces it. His used car salesman persona doesn't go over well with most fans, and I can imagine these stories about who he is outside of the game affects this ranking as well. But overall, Brian is someone who barely wins on what is widely considered one of the worst seasons of Survivor of all time. I do have a story video all about his win if you are morbidly curious, but for now, Brian Heideck scores a 15.6%. Number 39, Bob Crowley of season 17, Gabon is by far one of the most baffling winners of all time, which works well given the season that he wins. He does go on a tear, which is crazy as an old man, to win a bunch of individual challenges, making the best fake immunity necklace of all time, and he has a charming bow tie buff. As a character, Bob is great. I don't think many will argue with this. According to the poll you all filled out, it was his gameplay that most weren't impressed by. The season's storytelling seemed to be setting up a sugar win, so when she blows it at the end, combined with us learning that everyone really doesn't like her, and uh, Bob's also sitting next to Susie. She's, she's there, she's on the season as a player. Bob doesn't seem to beat a very impressive cast considering Gabon is a hot mess of comedic errors and bitterness, and Bob doesn't do that well at Final Tribal, really putting the nail in the yeah, I guess he played an okay game coffin that he found himself in. I do think that him not dominating the season makes the season as a whole better, 
but it doesn't make for the most impressive winner. So Bob Crowley scores a 21.2%. Number 38, Russell Hance of season 19, Samoa loses to Natalie White. And I said those names in a specific order because that's how the season is. He is used as a meat shield by Natalie because he burns everyone all game and treats the jury like crap. So no way are they voting for him. The other person in the final three is Mick, who comes across like a cocky know-it-all who didn't really do anything. So why not vote for Natalie? At least she's nice, sweet, well-spoken, and is not someone you would feel bad about giving money to, unlike the other two that she is sitting next to. Yeah, this season does a poor job at telling us why Natalie deserved a win versus why Russell blew it. But that storyline is a big reason why Natalie is this low on this list when I personally think she should be a few spots higher. Let's get this straight. She beats Russell Hance and it wasn't even close. So this isn't like a close 4-3 vote. She crushes him. What is disappointing though when you're trying to defend her win is watching the raw video from when they vote at Tribal and hearing her say for 80% of the season that she is just doing whatever the majority wants. It's not impressive even if she is someone who would be a cool person to hang out with in real life and Natalie White scores a 24.9%. Number 37, Ben Drebergen of season 35, Heroes vs. Healers vs. Hustlers, is in a similar boat to Chris Underwood, minus the part where he's voted out and then comes back into the game. This time the fans are upset by production decisions, but those production decisions are not a season long twist but instead are endless idols hidden in easy locations and a surprise final four fire making twist that stops Ben from losing in fourth place to sitting instead in the final tribal council where most fans thought he didn't belong in. Talks of possible production interference overshadowed the messy game Ben played where he worked tirelessly to save himself while others sat around banking on the rest of the season playing out in a predictable fashion. After all, he doesn't win five to two to one because of idols and a surprise twist, but he also isn't at the end without them, and that is enough to sour most on his win. Ben Drebergen scores a 30.4%. We now move into our next category of winners called They're Okay, I Guess. Number 36, RS of Season 12, Exile Island, also known as Panama, is boring. That's the biggest knock against him because no doubt his gameplay is solid and his mild personality is a big reason why the Kasaya tribe stays together and doesn't fall apart every single episode like they clearly are trying to do whether they want to or not. He fixed a lot of messes and made sure to always keep the target squarely on Terry so no one really thought about Aris instead. It isn't terribly exciting and when he wins it does feel like he earns it but it isn't anything to write home about. I do have a story video all about his win if you are interested, but for now, R scores a 48.9%. Number 35, Tommy Sheehan of season 39, Island of the Idols feels a lot like Aris to me. He plays a purely social game in a time where big moves rule the show's narrative, so he's kind of pushed to the side in the storytelling as drama plays out and advantages are flying around everywhere. This means he isn't super exciting to watch, but his gameplay this season proves that no matter how much the show wants to pitch that playing a flashy game is how you win, it isn't really the truth. The social game rules all and is the reason why juries vote for you, not big idol plays. I do think part of why he's ranked this low is due in part to how bad this season is and by association it affects Tommy's placement on this list due to no fault of his own. So Tommy Sheehan scores a 49.8%. Number 34, Erica of Season 41, aptly titled Survivor 41, played a game that had her self-described as a lion dressed like a lamb. Her story for most of the season was really quiet, like a lamb. She was on the winning tribe who avoided tribal, and aside from smashing the questionable hourglass twist at the merge, she was so under the radar that even the massive red flag shown to us in Episode 4 had people brushing it aside as nothing, when in all actuality, that was the big hint that, hey, Erica might win this thing. So once the Shan blindside happens in the last third of the season, the show goes, aha, see, Erica is the real contender. But the reveal is kind of lame and underwhelming. And of course she earns the win, but the storytelling of the season undercuts her by hiding her for far too long from her eyes. I do have a story video all about her win and what you didn't see, but for now, Erica scores a 51.7%. Number 33, Amber Burkich of Season 8 All-Stars is the first person to cause an uproar in the fandom with their win. While her falling in love with Boston Rob and their proposal before the vote reveal did help ease the woes of an underwhelming game to the general fandom, almost everyone cried foul at how she won when clearly Boston Rob did all the work. But like Natalie White, Amber didn't make the jury hate her and really, sometimes, that's all that matters. Winning Survivor is only about reaching the end and then convincing the jury to vote for you. 
nothing more nothing less that's all that's required now she does barely beat rob by one vote but she did win against a cast widely considered to be the best of the best from the first seven seasons i do have a story video all about her if you're interested in her journey and how her and rob fell in love but for now amber burkage scores a 51.9 percent Number 32, Fabio of season 21, Nicaragua, is all character and the poll you all filled out reflects this. Not many were impressed by his gameplay, but like Bob Crowley before him, many fell in love with him as a character. Here is this goofball who pees and pools during the middle of challenges that goes on a crazy immunity streak to save his butt and really is so rarely in the right when he's voting for who's going home. Most of the time he has no idea what's going on and he does ultimately win in a very close controversial vote that includes two quitters on the jury. His winner's quote in episode one is so clearly fabricated by the storytellers that they felt confident enough that the fan base wouldn't catch on even though it's so so obvious in retrospect but why did they think we wouldn't catch on because fabio is a nut in the best way possible but if you're looking for great gameplay then it isn't here but if you're looking for a great character oh that is fabio with that fabio scores a 54.3 percent so we move on to our next category called good but not great number 31 mike holloway of season 30 worlds apart played a game of two different stories the first half of his story is how he is a good hard-working guy who does irk some people with his personality and once he outwits joe all of a sudden he becomes the big target on the board so he has a fire lit underneath his butt he tries to make a bold yet very stupid move at the auction when he baffles everyone including jeff probst with his fake out for the letters why did he do this to get the advantage but this only burns everyone especially dan as he becomes target number one the rest of the season thankfully he goes on a crazy immunity streak and has an idol to save himself from elimination and he goes on to have an excellent final tribal council where he persuades most of the people that he burnt to vote for him including dan mike's story is a lot like a movie but he's on a season full of conflict and drama and it becomes a bit boring to watch him just win immunity after immunity Mike Holloway scores a 67%. Number 30, Danny Boatwright of season 11 Guatemala is a victim of bad storytelling and this won't be the last time I say this, in fact it's affected a few winners before this and it will affect a few winners after. Not only does she not help the show out by hiding what she's doing from them, but she also has a movie like story to reach the end except the show is almost uninterested in telling that story since there are bigger characters making drama and yelling about add at tribal council along with a returnee who eats up a lot of screen time danny plays a solid yet unspectacular game where she clearly earned it but it just wasn't exciting to watch i do have a story video all about her if you're interested in her journey but for now danny boatwright scores a 67.1 percent Number 29, Michelle Fitzgerald of season 32, Ko Rong, has a similar tale to Natalie White and Amber Burkich. The show is far more concerned with the second place player than the actual winner who takes a back seat in the storytelling. Michelle has an amazing social game combined with her ability to largely avoid tribal councils due to fortunate circumstances for her, and you can see why the show wasn't focused on her despite her solid game that translates well to other seasons. Now, usually these rankings are not at all concerned with how anyone played on their non-winning seasons, but I want to bring up her winners at war appearance as it shows just how good her Korong game is and how it translates to other seasons. When you go back and watch Korong, you realize that sure, Aubrey is the focus there, but Aubrey wasn't robbed. Michelle was just the better player. Michelle Fitzgerald scores a 71.1%. Number 28, Sophie Clark of season 23 South Pacific has a similar story to Natalie White and Amber Burkich. And wait a second, this is deja vu yet again. She hid behind the meat shield of the second place player, Coach, as he led the charge while also fumbling jury management, whereas Sophie played a quiet game till the end when she just throws Coach and Albert under the bus and tells the jury, yeah, everything I did was on purpose, even if it didn't look like it was on purpose. It doesn't make for an exciting story the whole time, but it is an effective strategy on this particular season with this particular cast. She played the cards she was handed beautifully, whereas many other players would have blown it and let Coach win. Sophie Clark scores a 77.6%. Number 27, Adam Klein of season 33, Millennials vs Gen X tries a tactic that is bold and I'm not sure many could pull off. His strategy was to just be completely honest so often that people thought he is always telling them the truth so that when he decides to lie they have no idea that he is doing it since that's a foreign concept. In a game of Survivor where it's usually the opposite, everyone's always lying unless they're telling the truth in a rare circumstance, Adam's strategy bucks that trend. He led people to trusting him and while it didn't make him some unbeatable force who was guaranteed to win 
against anyone in the final three, it does set him up nicely. Combine this with the story of him grieving over his mother, who is in the hospital on her deathbed as he is playing, and Adam not only has a touching story, but is impressive as a player as well. However, many fans see the story as a retread of how Jeremy had won seasons prior, at least in their minds, and despite that not being the case, fan perception does shape a lot of how seasons are remembered along with winners. Also, Adam loves to just yell all of his confessionals, which can be grating. Adam Klein scores a 79.6%. Number 26, Wendell Holland of season 36, Ghost Island plays a dominating game alongside Dominic Abate. These two go hand in hand all season, and once they reach the merge, it's really a two horse race between them, which shows just how big of powerhouses they were, but it also makes watching the back half of Ghost Island a chore. It was a chore live, and it's a chore on a repeat watch. How many times can Laurel threaten to vote off Wendell and then not do it? The answer, every time. Unlike some winners who are higher on this list, Wendell did need a partner in crime to dominate the season, so when Jeff reveals the jury is split evenly between Wendell and Dom for who should win, it is the perfect cap on his game. Laurel breaks that tie and does give it to Wendell, but that just goes to show how much credit each of these two players should get between Wendell and Dom. So with that, Wendell Holland scores an 80.1%, and now we move on to the next section of these rankings that I'm calling On the Cusp of Greatness. Number 25, John Cochran of Season 26, Caramo, and AKA Fans versus Favorites 2, was the clear front runner to win this season. The cast consists only of a few good players and a whole lot of duds, and mostly, big characters. But gameplay wise, Cochran's one of the few who are out there to win. He knows how to handle the mess around him and play a perfect game. That's right, a literal perfect game. He doesn't receive any votes against him and he gets every single juror's vote. The show made it obvious he was going to win as he loved telling the camera exactly what it wanted to hear to make good TV. It's just a shame he did this on a season widely considered to be a hot mess that did not feel like it earned the title of fans versus favorites like the other version of fans versus favorites does. John Cochran scores a 82.6%. Number 24, Sarah Lucina of season 34 Game Changers played an impressive game where she turned heel. What this means is that in Kaigayan, her first time playing, she tried to be the good guy, but saw how being bad helped Tony win her season. So she decided to fall suit and turn bad herself when she played in Game Changers against the cast of returnees. It all started by eliminating anyone with a big name before the merge, followed by a big swing vote decision, which unlike in Kagayan, she handles gracefully here, setting herself up for the long game. She played a brutal end game that made multiple players look like fools, but despite the great gameplay, Sarah's actual story is a bit dull in places, due to a shift this season to focusing on big moves and endless talk about advantages. This had been coming for a few seasons now, but Game Changers really jumps the shark with the endless advantages. So that made connecting with some players harder as a result. And with that, Sarah Lucina scores an 83.5%. Number 23, Vesepia Towery of season four Marquesas did something no other winner prior to her did. She played a lone wolf game that saw her doing her own thing, floating between alliances as she saw fit, so she would just flip at any time she wanted. And she ruthlessly eliminated big players, including the favorite to win, Kathy in cutthroat fashion. She was a character that the show liked to focus on a lot in the beginning and at the end, but for some reason in this large stretch in the middle, she's forgotten about, which makes her story mm, a little underwhelming as a result. This is a case where I think the storytelling fails an interesting character who played a great game that made everyone reconsider how to win Survivor because after the first three winners, it seemed like there was one template to do it. I do have a story video all about her if you are interested in her journey, but for now, Vesepia scores an 83.8%. Number 22, Sandra Diaz Twine of season 20, Heroes vs. Villains, was the same sassy smart mouth, take no crap lady from Pearl Islands. But now she's surrounded by an even bigger cast of larger than life characters than before. She is out there pretty much doing exactly what she did in Pearl Islands, anyone but me. But now there are more distractions which not only allow people to ignore that they're letting a winner get to the end, but also assuming that she doesn't connect with the jury. Basically Sandra is somehow under the radar and this results in a storytelling that ignores her at times, but in the background she is socially connecting with others while also making sure she is the antithesis to the season's most hated player. Russell. The game that she is playing is somehow more impressive at times and also less impressive at times than her win in Pearl Islands. With that, Sandra Diaz Twine of Heroes vs. Villains scores an 84.5%. Number 21, Boston Rob of Season 22 Redemption Island 
being this low on the list is bound to ruffle some feathers. After all, number 21 on this list means he is dead center in the middle. Now, I would personally have him higher as he played a crazy good game and what he said happened, happened. He was a mafia boss. He was the Rob father. Once Russell's voted out and gone from the season, it becomes all about boss and Rob for better or for worse, which shows just how good he is. He even expertly handles Redemption Island in a way that shows everyone how to deal with this in the future. And somehow those players in the future don't heed his advice. Get rid of those players immediately. That's how Chris Underwood won. However, Boston Rob's competition was lackluster at best. I would argue his game on All Stars was more impressive given they were all returnees, but here he crushes a bunch of recruited players and shows that yeah, he is carrying his family literally on his back, and maybe he did inspire David to copy him and propose at the reunion. But frankly, it isn't as impressive as if he had won All Stars instead. Boston Rob scores an 86.5%. Number 20, Marianne of season 42, AKA Survivor 42, is a breath of fresh air. Here is a newbie winner who is loud, bold, and weird. When was the last time a newbie winner like this? My recollection is it would be season 28, Tony, which is 14 seasons ago from Marianne's win. She strategically made some fine moves and was smart enough to realize that she had dug herself a hole in the pre-merge and she got out of it. Her final tribal seals the deal as well, but when you win a 26 day season, it does lessen your win a bit when pretty much everyone else won a 39 day season. Combine this with her being a divisive figure who annoyed many and beat the favorite in Mike. And you can see why Marianne falls almost dead center on this list. I love her, but others find her grading. I do have a story video all about her if you were interested in her journey, but for now, Marianne scores an 86.7%. Number 19, Tom Westman of season 10 Palau played a dominating game that was helped by the collapse of the Oolong tribe and Survivor never trying to help Oolong as a result. There was not even a tribe swap or a merge. That's right, no merge happened this season. Tom led the Karor tribe to the end and made sure they never went to tribal council unless the show forced them to. He played the role of noble leader while also smartly manipulating many in the game to do his bidding. Combine this with winning so many immunities that he's actually only eligible to be voted out at three tribal councils all season. One of those immunity wins includes him staying on a buoy for almost 12 hours and convincing the person who will end up being voted out in third place and was really his only competition in the final two to just drop and give Tom the win. Wow. Unfortunately, despite being popular with the average fan when this season aired, some modern fans don't like how he manipulated those on Karor and have tainted what was once considered the gold standard for winners. I do have a story video all about his win if you are interested in that journey, but for now, Tom Westman scores an 87.2%. Number 18, Nick Wilson of season 37, David vs. Goliath, has an incredible story as a David becoming a king, which ties into the season nicely, as you might imagine, along with some big game moves and a late game immunity streak to secure his win. However, Nick is not as big of a character as some of the other big names on this season. So in a season full of huge characters doing crazy things, Nick, eh, he's a bit more subdued but he has an incredible story himself. I would say Nick holds his own well enough and should be a little bit higher on this list, but there are some big names here, so I can understand how he fell to 18. After all, he helped Angelina climb what I think was like 300 feet on a ladder to get an idol where she almost died. Thanks, Nick, thanks. Nick Wilson scores a 90.7%. Number 17, Sandra Diaz Twine of season seven, Pearl Islands played an impressive game, all things considered. She navigated the out of left field outcast twist, Johnny Fairplay and her alliance falling apart early on in the merge. Her anyone but me strategy combined with her loud sassy attitude worked so well as she was the antithesis to Fairplay. Hmm, that sounds a little familiar to Heroes vs. Villains. And she was sure to befriend Lil, securing her placement at the final two. Her story starts quiet and ends strong combined with the final tribal where she handles almost everyone flawlessly. But at no point does she stop being Sandra just to please others. She isn't everyone's cup of tea, but in Pearl Islands, you the fans found it more impressive than her game in Heroes vs. Villains. I do have a story video all about her win if you're interested in her journey, but for now, Sandra Diaz Twine of Pearl Islands scores a 91.3%. Number 16, Kim Spradlin of Season 24 One World has a similar game to Boston Rob of Season 22, except this is not Kim's fourth time playing like it was for Boston Rob, it is her first, and she dominates a cast full of 
nobodies. In retrospect, it can be hard to tell if the cast was just so bad because she looked so good or if they were really just bad no matter who they played with. I would personally argue the latter as I can't see a single other player on the season even coming close to what Kim pulled off here. I know her placement being this low is in part due to One World being a dull season to watch and Kim not being the most engaging person in confessionals, but she sure does pull off a masterclass of how to play your first game. Kim Spradlin scores a 91.9%. Number 15, JT Thomas of season 18 Token Chains plays the first ever perfect game. Considering that only him and Cochran have pulled this off, it's mighty impressive as JT was the first one to prove that yeah, this is possible. Earl Cole, who was later on this list, came so close, but JT actually pulled it off. At the merge, JT overcame a huge 6-3 tribal deficit after Joe's medical evacuation, where him and Steven Fishback outwitted a cast full of big characters and even a future winner and a future second place player in Tyson and Coach respectively. He lies, backstabs, and does it all while making people feel good about him on their way out the door. It's a work of art, and at Final Tribal, he even makes sure to bury Steven with no mercy. I do have a story video all about his perfect win if you're interested in that journey, but for now, JT Thomas scores a 92%. Number 14, Chris Doherty of Season 9 Vanuatu is amazing, and I'm not sure how else to describe this underrated winner. His story starts off slow, sure, but once the merge hits and the women are clearly dominating the game after bamboozling the men's tribe, he takes off like a rocket. Chris plays no holds barred while also schmoozing everyone at every chance he gets. He basically plays as if he has nothing to lose and it is so much fun to watch. When is he being truthful and when is he being dramatic? all the time, all the time. This man's story is the definition of a movie on Survivor, and I wish he were higher up on this list because it is something amazing to witness and it gets overlooked far too often. How he manages to navigate big personalities, lie to everyone, and schmooze the jury is beyond me, but I love it. I do have a story video all about his win if you're interested in that journey, but for now, Chris Doherty scores a 92.3%. Number 13, Natalie Anderson of Season 29, San Juan del Sur, aka Blood vs. Water 2, is a rarity on this list. She is an extremely athletic woman who isn't afraid to speak her mind while also playing a ruthless endgame. While I am personally not a big fan of this season, I cannot deny how great of a winner she is, especially with how she played. She would turn loved ones against each other and cause others to make public mistakes at Tribal Council to keep the target off of her back and also, of course, make a show out of how she's playing. When most women on this list play quieter games than her, Natalie wasn't afraid to play a loud one, and I think Sandra would be proud. With that, Natalie Anderson scores a 93%. Now it is time for the next section of our list, Greatness Achieved. Number 12, Denise Stapley of Season 25, Philippines did something no other winner has ever done. She attends every single tribal council this season and survives them all. She never gets a break from going to tribal and yet still wins the game. She survives the terrible Matt Singh tribe, going to a new tribe all by herself, and survives a crazy merge game with unpredictable players namely those in Scoop and Elisa, who she sits next to in the final three. Denise is surrounded by bigger characters, and I do believe this helps her reach the end, like so many others on this list, but her actual game is nothing to scoff at, as she has no issue knocking out her partner in crime, Malcolm. Denise Stapley scores a 94.8%. Number 11, Tyson Apostle of Season 27, Blood vs. Water did something that no one else on this list accomplishes, believe it or not. He got his first win on his third time playing. No joke, if it wasn't for Tyson, I would say that playing your third time without ever having won your first two is a curse. So many have tried and failed, but the Coconut Bandit pulled it off. He did tone down a lot of his villainous quirks from his previous few times playing and made a smart move in turning the season into a battle between those who still had their loved ones in the game and those who lost their loved ones. He made an incredibly risky move by doing the infamous rock drop final six, but as everyone else on this list has proven, luck was on his side. Tyson Apostle scores a 94.9%. Number 10, Richard Hatch of Season 1 Borneo showed everyone the basics of how to play Survivor before anyone even knew how this game worked. While it is true that he wasn't the first to try and form an alliance, he is the first to successfully navigate an alliance all the way through the game while staying together despite the infighting. They stuck together to overthrow Pagong and win despite a reputation for playing a villainous game. Richard was cocky and he knew it, but his people skills were excellent and his willingness to throw the final immunity challenge was so far ahead of its time that the host Jeff Probst was clearly baffled by the idea of anyone throwing a challenge on purpose, let alone the final immunity. Players later on will try to copy his strategy here, but 
no one understands it like he does. I think it's so clear that Jeff is disappointed that this works when he reveals who won the season and just the look on Jeff's face. Yeah, he didn't want Rich to win either. In retrospect, Rich's game was truly basic, not really that villainous, but his people skill set him apart from the rest along with his willingness to entertain. I do have a story video all about his win if you are interested in that journey, but for now, Richard Hatch scores a 95.2%. Number 9. Jeremy Collins of Season 31, Cambodia, aka Second Chances, had a chip on his shoulder. He was burdened with the emotional toils of playing with his wife on San Juan del Sur, but this time, he was determined to right the ship and win it all because that wife was now pregnant with his child. In a season full of huge strategic moves and a general willingness to get away from the idea of season-long alliances, it was Jeremy who broke the mold and channeled his inner Richard Hatch and formed an alliance that carried him to the end of the game. Who would have thought that's how it would work? Oh, and he nets himself every single jury vote. He even plays an idol to successfully negate all votes against him, making his game perfect but with an asterisk. It just depends on your point of view on do the negative votes count or not. Jeremy Collins scores a 96.4%. Number 8. Earl Cole of Season 14 Fiji was so clearly the winner the whole time that it wasn't even funny. He stood head and shoulders above the rest playing one of the most balanced games of all time and not even needing his idol to save himself. He had no issue turning on Yao Man, the only other real contender to win, to sit next to two goats at the end and even survive the tumultuous Ravu tribe. Earl almost became the first ever player to play a perfect game, coming one vote shy of this due to a stray vote from Rita in episode 3. He is a beacon of hope in an otherwise boring season, and as he calls himself, he is the original King of Fiji. I do have a story video all about his win if you're interested in that journey, but for now, Earl Cole scores a 96.7%. Number 7, Tina Weston of season 2, the Australian Outback is probably a surprise this high up on the list for most, as she was for me as well when I compiled all the data. Not one person out of almost 700 people who filled this thing out said Tina was their least favorite, which is saying a lot considering how almost every single winner had at least one person say, yeah, that's my least favorite, but not Tina. She benefits a lot from being likable and also playing a secretly cutthroat game that I would argue is more devious than Richard's and is a precursor to Tom Westman in a way. She manipulates others through smiling and is the brains of her onion alliance that convinces Colby to throw his game away to give it to her. I can't knock her at all as the only time I questioned if she made a bad move was her timing on voting out Jerry Manthe, but she still handles it quite well. I do have a story video all about her if you're interested in her journey, but for now, Tina Wesson scores a 97.5%. Number 6, Parvati Shallow of Season 16 Micronesia aka Fans vs Favorites played an entertaining game that saw her flirting with men to then turn around and cut all their throats. We saw hints of this player in Cook Islands, but such a massive step forward was taken in between the seasons that saw Parvati being a part of the Black Widow Brigade and then eliminating them in such a devious fashion that is undeniably entertaining to watch. The men never stood a chance. The other women in the brigade also didn't stand a chance. This is the Parvati that Jeff Probst falls in love with and her follow-up appearance on Heroes vs. Villains only solidifies that her game here is not a fluke or happenstance. She just is that good. Parvati Shallow scores a 98.1%. Number 5. Ethan Zahn of Season 3 Africa blows my mind that he cracked the top 5 of this list, but once I looked at the numbers, it became obvious why. Everyone loves this guy. He is the second most liked winner on this list. Number 1 is coming up later. Ethan's game is fairly straightforward as he rides his majority lines to the end, eliminating threats along the way. Heck, he even pioneers throwing a challenge to get rid of an opposing tribe's player back when that was a villainous thing to do. People like Ethan for who he is, and I would be foolish to say that him using his million dollars from the season to found grassroots soccer and him also surviving cancer twice has nothing to do with his ranking here. I'm sure it does play a part. How can you not like Ethan? He's just a good guy. I do have a story video all about his win if you're interested in that journey, but for now, Ethan's on scores a 98.7%. Number 4, Tony Vlakos of Season 28 Kagayan played an electric game that ignited the fire under the fan base that we haven't felt since Russell Hance played on Samoa. Who is this madman playing the game like a crazed lunatic that makes two dumb moves for every three smart moves? It's baffling to watch, but there is beauty in the chaos as he works so hard all the time to win this game. This guy works overtime. Not only does he find a super idol, but he makes it work for him past its expiration date, something we've never seen before, as he then manages to trick Wu into bringing him to the final two over a guaranteed win against Cass. The paragraph I have allotted myself here cannot express the insane beauty of his Kai Gaian win, 
which is why Tony Vlachos of Kai Gaian scores a 99.5%. And with that, we move on to the final section of our winner rankings, which I call royalty. Number three, Yul Kwan of season 13, Cook Islands is beloved by almost everyone. You remember earlier when I said Ethan Zahn was the second most liked? Well, Yul is the number one most liked on this list. I believe it's due to his general good nature, incredible intellect, and just being kind, even when he's playing cutthroat. Every move he makes is calculated, and the super idol that he finds early on in episode two almost seems meaningless at times since his four person alliance overthrows the larger eight man alliance by winning challenges and taking advantage of social weaknesses. In a cast full of big characters, Yule is quieter, but this is a nice contrast as he gives us the level headed perspective of what's going on around here. And it's crazy that the only person to figure out how to get rid of Yule's super idol is Cowboy, and the moment Cowboy says his insane plan, Yule's like, that's that's so crazy, but Cowboy's right, now I have to get rid of him. I do have a story video all about Yule's win if you're interested in that journey, but for now, Yule Kwan scores a 102.2% due to so many people picking him as their favorite winner. Number two, Todd Herzog of season 15 China played an excellent game on a season which mathematically was the easiest to win of all time. It's 16 players with the final three and this is the only time this has ever happened. Todd was a big character with a super fan brain playing against a cast of big characters and a few good strategists. How anyone let him reach the end is beyond me since he was always eligible to be voted out and he wasn't hiding, he was playing pretty openly. But no, he was just that good. The icing on the cake is his final Tribal Council performance, which many refer to as the greatest of all time. Todd Herzog scores a 103.7%. Number one, Tony Vlachos of season 40, Winners at War, is the greatest winner of all time. Now it's not like his second win was him just squeaking by to have the other winners overlook him. Oh no, he purposely toned down his insanity publicly, but kept doing it when no one was looking, running around like a madman, building spy nests, just doing insane stuff all the time. He was still working overtime, he was just doing it more secretly now. He worked his butt off to get rid of curses sent his way from the edge of extinction, and he had the wherewithal to not unleash publicly how good he is playing until later in the game when no one really had a chance to stop him because he went on to win four individual immunity challenges, but he always acted like, oh shucks, I don't know how I won that challenge, I'm not good at challenges. And in a season full of top tier players, he played head and shoulders above them all. I do have a story video all about his win if you're interested in that journey, but for now, Tony Vlachos of Winners at War scores a 104.5%. So that is every single winner ranked as of 2022. Let me know, do you agree with these rankings? Did the fans get it right or did they get it wrong? Thanks for watching and doubly thanks for liking and subscribing. See you all next time.